thank you once again for uh, for inviting me to to speak, particularly on a topic that I uh, love and hold very dear. Um, I would like to start out. This was the very first book that uh, I was able to get published, um, and it's, it goes through the ABCs of the liturgy. But in the back, it has a prayer that I think that every child should memorize, and so we're going to pray that now, the prayer of St. John Chrysostom. Chrysostom. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto Thee, and has promised through Thy well-beloved Son that when two, and th two or three are gathered together in His name, Thou wilt be with in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Catechetical aesthetics was a phrase that I came up with while reading Hans Jörs von, von Balthasar, and that, we're going to get to him Soon. This is uh, the dummy's guide to, 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 to Balthazar, the key to Balthazar. Um, this is Balthazar 101. And so I brought it to, so you could take a look at it. And um, it has a bibliography as well that will really show his, his writings. But one of the things about Balthazar is that he constantly believe that truth and beauty could never be separated because truth and beauty are rooted in Scripture. If Scripture is the truth, then that is beautiful. And if something is beautiful, it also must be true. So all beauty comes from, flows from Scripture. And of course, as Lutherans, we would say that. Balthazar sort of takes a couple turns uh, into penance and, and, and then things like that. But basically, if he hadn't written so much, it would be my life's goal to uh, turn him Lutheran in his grave. You know, it's to, to turn all of his work into uh, a Lutheran understanding of beauty and catechesis. His phrase was theological aesthetics. I changed it to catechetical aesthetics because copyright infringement. <laughs> no, it's not true. I don't think, I don't think he would sue me because uh, he's probably in purgatory at, at this point. Um, but what I, the reason I did so was because I, wa I wanted to, to teach the members of Augustana the term catechesis and that everything is catechetical. There is nothing that is not catechetical. It can either, be, it can either catechize well or it can catechize poorly, but everything catechizes. You know, when we look at the worship wars, we understand that things catechize, whether it does so well or whether it does so poorly, is up to passion, well, belief, passion, and execution. Um, Father Chris did a wonderful job this morning with, with Matins, and that is an example of doing liturgy well, um, particularly without an organ, which 
we would like to have all of our members be able to do that, right? To, to sing at least one stanza, maybe like the third stanza, without the organ. And I know that they do that at Fort Wayne. I'm sure they do it at St. Louis where you're playing the organ and you're singing along and then they just drop out one of the uh, stanzas and all you hear is the, is the voices. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. Guarantee you, you do it at Augustine or any other church, nobody's going to be singing. They're going to say, well, I, guess, well, I guess we're stopping here. <laughs> um, but beauty as catechetical aesthetics, as we move on, what brought me to catechetical aesthetics, and if you go on to YouTube, you can find uh, you can search Augustana Evangelical Lutheran Church, and you can find in there. Well, first you have to make sure that you click on the Augustana seal and not the Agnus Dei, because it's like you have two paths diverged in a wood. One takes you to Hickory and the LCMS, and the other one takes you to the ELCA. So make sure you click on the on the one with the the symbol and not the, not, not the lamb. Um, and in there you'll find three one hour videos called Teach Us Augustana. And how I came about that was when I first got to Augustana, I noticed that I would go into the sanctuary and people would not know what things were. For example, they could probably name five of the Stained glass windows. Our stained glass is, is much like your stained glass uh, in the behind the Rarados. That um, thick, uh, chipped off uh, glass. It's not. Uh, it's called Cantal de Vere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's not. It's not like that with with the pictures, and you can actually see the stick. Yeah, you can actually see Jesus and see what he's what he's doing, but rather more uh, stylized and more difficult to, to interpret. Um, there's even one that has thrown me that I'm pretty sure is a fiery chariot, but I'm still not exactly sure. Uh, so I just wing it with that one. Um, but what brought me to it was that they, the members of Augustana, we had a fire in 91, and the pastor who rebuilt the church taught and wrote up the, uh, things about the, the, the church, the new church, but people had either forgotten or had, hadn't listened in, in, in the first place, or new members have, had come in and never known Okay, so I'm at, so I'm teaching and I'm, and I'm pointing things out in the sanctuary, and they don't know what, what, what it means. So whether your baptismal font has three sides, eight sides, or is round, all three of those things teach. But you have to teach them. If you do not teach them, people will just see. Well, that's where we splash babies. Hopefully deeper than that, but. Is art and, ca and, and catechetical art or aesthetics objective or subjective? And you have three examples here. I, I think when the art artist makes it, he has a specific purpose in mind. In that sense, it is definitely objective. There is a one meaning that the artist had in mind when he set, when he made it, and when he, he had in mind when a person looks at this, he wants them to think this. Like when we see the cross, we see the cross of Christ, we see his crucifixion. That's what it means. Not take it out in the world, they'll see something else in it, but that doesn't change what the cross is supposed to mean, and that it is an objective symbol of Christ. Right. So when Madonna used the Christ in the uh, music awards, we, we knew what it was and that it was blasphemous. Precisely. Yeah. 
Um, well, maybe not as extreme when you when you can't quite tell if it's a fiery chariot or the fires of hell or just a, a beautiful sunset that reminds us of God's creation. Okay, then do we have do we have the right to just make it up? No. So you're saying it's not subjective at all? N not when the artist does it. But all, all art, all, all artist does art. Mm -hmm. Even the creator of the world, right? And, and all nature sings the praise of God, doesn't it? Yes. So, but is are, are we able to say that art is subjective at all? Please, no. Doc. I'll play. <laughs> see, see, this, this is a problem. I, I talked too much yesterday to 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 you guys. So, thank you. <laughs> no, I, I think it's. I think it's arguable that um, in visual art, often in, in poetry as well, but in visual art, the artist also intends for the, for the viewer to interact with it. And, and it's in that, you know, it's the old, does, does the tree that falls in the woods and no one hears it make a sound? Uh, and there's a sense in which art gains its meaning in its particular viewing. So when you say, I really, this is my favorite painting, um, you can't really argue with the person. You can't really say, no, it's not. Your favorite painting has to be this one. Um, so there clearly is a subjective element both to appreciation of art and to the creation of meaning in art. It's just how much, uh, well, I'll play. I say it's 80% in the ear and the viewer. 80% of the viewers so are subjective. Mm -hmm. Okay. Please. Can two of us play? <laughs> yeah, as long as you play, as long as you play nice. Play <laughs> this is all, all guesswork. I'm, I'm down and around looking at aesthetics trying to answer that great question. Well, that's why, that's why I use these three uh, examples here. Uh, by the way, um, does anyone know who the artist that did this? Good, me neither. <laughs> That's why I put it up there, <laughs> it was so that we could, because I, I know these two artists, I don't know this artist, so we can look at it together and in, in, interpret it, because we don't know what the artist intended, although we can see. So I still want to write. Yeah, I, yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, so, so I'm thinking that there is an objective Component, a significant objective component, uh, insofar as we're wired by God, you know, to to perceive everything as each through our senses, uh, and and that there are things then that are in harmony with God's idea of what's beautiful. So symmetry, the use of color, these types of things will resonate with us. In music, you know, there you, you will clearly. Think of something as uh, as being more beautiful when it's you know, constant rather than distant. You know, two and a half steps played at the same time is just hard. So you know, I think whether it's music or words or, or visual, sensory, sensual taste, we know when something's bitter and we know when something's sweet. So to that degree, there is an objective component, but the assigning uh, a measure to that. I don't know who or how we would go about doing that. Well, I think that that was, uh, that was your point. I mean, you really, you really can't do the, you can't really can't play the percentage game so much. But there definitely is a subjective component. I'd like to play also. Give me three point no. Oh. <laughs> Let, let's let's. Uh, I, would, I, would, would you like Rio Haas for five hundred? Yes. yes, please. Um, <laughs> we we should take two symbols that to us mean the same thing, but it's all contextual, the naked cross and the crucifix. And we're going to go uh, there. <laughs> well, it's if, if, too if, long. if you're going to go there, then I don't want to steal your thunder. I'll, 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 I'll yield the floor to you. you. No, please use the example, because I've got, uh, I'm sure I can say other things too. Uh, the, na the naked cross is uh, at can, it's undeniably a uh, dodecahedron. It's a 12-sided uh, geometric shape. Uh, we yeah, I wasn't going to say that. <laughs> we see it as as being a, one of the many symbols for Christ crucified, 
But a better symbol, of course, is the crucifix itself, because that is undeniable. Whether you are the Dalai Lama or the you know the, the, the Grand Rabbi of Jerusalem, you know what it is. You hate it. You don't. You don't say that it that is your Savior who died for the forgiveness of your sins, which is what we know to be true. But nevertheless, no one can deny what that. Um, what that depiction means, or what it what it uh, represents, uh, what it visually represents, as opposed to the naked cross, that can mean virtually anything. Right. Um, you said you, uh, that that they they hate it. Now, now that is a, that's a really good point because. <clears throat> That is still, it's, it's still objective. objective. Yeah. I mean, no one's going to say that's not Jesus on the cross. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Um, uh, They're not going to say it's Mohammed um, suffering for, for or, 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 or Madonna. Oh. Right, yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's objective. Uh, but they subjectively hate it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so there is definitely is that component. I don't think we do ourselves justice by saying that there, that it, that there is no subjectivity. There's more subjectivity with the naked cross because you can impute into that far more meaning than you can a crucifix. Yeah, you, 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 can't, you can't look at a crucifix and say, well, that's actually Kenny Loggins, yes, right? right, right. Yeah. I'll begin with saying that I don't believe you can give a good answer to a bad question, but I'll take a shot. <laughs> I, because, because no, just from the standpoint, just, just from the standpoint, if it's a, it's a hundred percent objective, and it's a hundred percent objective, you know, we're, we're we're gonna we're gonna have to run with this one because the the, the idea of art and the perfection of God in creation, it, if I really had the ability to completely link the mind and the heart, it would be through such a tool, and and, and but that's all broken. It's messed up, you know, right. and, and so if we could have that perfect Seder and that link, the very reason you want that, as you're going to move into sanctuary space and holy space and things like that, because you're longing to link those up. Okay, so if we're willing to say that uh, that art, and particularly catechetical art, and let's say liturgical architecture, is therefore 100% objective, 100% subjective, then we could never make an argument against contemporary worship. That's Why is that? Well, B because because it, all comes, it all comes down to the subjectivity as the vote of the congregation or however you want to put the... So, so, so it's the collective sub subjectivity as to how we worship. It requires a denial of the objectivity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you totally <laughs> deny it. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. And, and that's what I'm saying. You totally can't. from... Yeah, but that isn't where decisions are made. You know, the, the, the cognitive relationship in a decision-making process is going to be more related in, in the objective than the motivation that is moved through through the heart. Just a question of clarification. The way the question was posed and kind of how we're answering it, is it a, is it a question of whether beauty is objective or subjective or whether art is objective, subjective? Because I think I would answer that question very differently depending on that question. I would say let's stick, art, let's stick, with, let's stick with beauty. Okay, because I think we've been answering art. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, and, and art, I, I think it's quite arguable just from the example that you gave that people are going to vote for whatever music they like, that art and the creation of meaning out of art has an, a massive subjective component to it. Yes. Um, now, the other question, though, is whether beauty is a standard by which we can, an objective standard by which we can measure things. So we can say things like, that's beautiful, that's less beautiful, that's more beautiful, and kind of what's the standard, or is that a moving target <clears throat> where we're always saying that's more beautiful than what, and that what is completely different from this person to that person. Um, and in that sense, I would say that, uh, so to play along, I would say with beauty, um, I, I guess I like Plato, you know, and, and that though there are variations on the theme, that there's a basic standard um, of objective, objectivity that we're all working with. 
you know, there's a lot of variations, but like I told you yesterday, nobody's going out seeing a sunset and saying, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Right. Um, so in that sense, I think we don't, linguistically, we can't even make sense of one another when we say that's good, better, best, beautiful, less beautiful, or ugly, unless we're all work, working with an assumed objective standard. And what is that objective standard? I that's don't know. Scripture. Well, I was working with the platonic forms, but okay. Well, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna play the trump card and say God God's word that 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 that, that is that is the standard in which we uh, uh, see all beauty. And that's also what Balthazar says, which is what makes him Lutheran, even though he didn't know it. Is that an objective or subjective standard when you say the, beauty? Uh, the the the, the uh, basically the uh, the test for beauty is is scripture. Is that an objective no, no, or subjective? Beauty, I, I would say that beauty flows from scripture. So 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 the truths that are that are uh, shown in liturgical architecture, that are shown in in liturgical appointments, that are shown in art, that are shown in any type of thing that we understand as beauty, um, must come from. Scripture. Is that objective or subjective? The scripture is not subjective. No, okay. Uh, <laughs> so, okay, the, give, then, then the answer is objective. Let me, I'm going to throw something down. You, you can address it now or you can ignore it. Um, or you can Thank address you it later. <laughs> uh, and that is beauty is irrelevant. When it comes to, when it comes to, when it comes to um, many objects of art, for us within the church, beauty is irrelevant. Okay, you can put it aside. I completely disagree um, because, because it's unavoidable. So uh, how can how can something be irrelevant if it's unavoidable? You're you're going to look at something and say it is beautiful or it is not. Whether whether you say it out loud or you say it in your mind. No. No, you don't. You, you don't judge. It does, beauty doesn't even. Okay, let's go back to the crucifix. Beauty doesn't even come into the picture for me. That is Christ crucified for the forgiveness of my sins. There, that's the beauty. The for, that's the beauty, and that's what we're, what we're going to talk about. The, the ugliness of the cross is the beauty of of the cross. You can say so, but to me, it, that doesn't even. Then you find it subjective. No, but it, it just is. It just is. Okay. Can I ask another question just to clarify this this conversation? By the way, I knew this was going to happen on this on this question. It happens every time. <laughs> uh, and that and that's the tentatio of my dissertation. <laughs> um, when you say that scripture is the measure for beauty, and this response sort of illustrated it for me. Um, you know, in, in Aristotle's rhetoric, he talks about kind of three different appeals. There's logos, there's ethos, and pathos. Mm -hmm. And um, when we talk about scripture and truth, we're, we're usually in the logos range. In other words, we're talking about the intellect, we're talking about logic, we're talking about... So, for instance, the concept of the forgiveness of sins is beautiful. Now, it has a, it has a pathetic component to it. It's got something that... But usually when we're talking about... Aesthetics and beauty and like and standards were usually in this in the realm of pathos. In other words, the um, that which affects the the emotions um, stirs something within you, and it rather it doesn't mean it doesn't have a logical component, um, but uh, it it's isn't. Automatic. It's automatic. Pardon? It's automatic. Well, yeah, I mean, in other words, when I make, just thinking of rhetoric, when I make an appeal to someone to, to move them towards my argument, I can make it on the basis of a logical argument about reason, I can make it on the basis of a moral argument of ethics, or I can appeal to their emotions. If I want someone to donate to uh, uh, feed Africa, I can, I can put up a picture of a starving child with flies on his face. That's not really a, a, a primarily an ethical or logical argument, that's a, that's a pathetic one. And, and um, often aesthetics finds itself in the, so I guess my, here's my question. When you say scripture is the measure for beauty, are you embedding that largely as a logos argument or are you giving, or are you still defining 
beauty in the realm of the kind of deeper pathos side of things. Yes. <laughs> I mean, obviously, because, obviously, because his response was a logos argument. Yeah, there's no was. beauty. In, there's no beauty. We don't care about beauty because all we care about is the logos. But most of beauty finds its place in the in the pathetic side of things. But right, right. That's why I say yes. Um, I, I do think that was a logical uh, appeal, and art usually is a pathos appeal. Uh, however, when we've drawn something out of scripture. I mean, obviously, this has a pathos appeal, a pathological appeal. But that also that doesn't mean that it does or does not depict the truth of Scripture. So the question is, does this depict the truth of Scripture? The, what, what we understand as the logos versus the, the pathos. I mean, that's, that's the question that we wrestle with when, when we deal with beauty and with aesthetics. And that's why I think Balthazar is right. And we'll get there in just one second. Go ahead. Well, I, I was just thinking about this argument, and we, we, most all of us wear a pectoral cross around. I, right, right now, I'm wearing my favorite crucifix. My favorite crucifix, so don't crucify me, but, but why is it my favorite crucifix? It's not because it's the most gorgeous cross in the world, not, not the most expensive cross in the world, but a very subjective meaning is the one I got from my great aunt Margaret's funeral. You know, that's why it's my favorite crucifix. And that's very subjective. That's very subjective. Well, it's very, it's very pathetic in the sense of... I know, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Okay. In the, in the sense of pathos. Uh, not, You're good. All, all, all respect to uh, your, your great aunt. Uh, uh, but yes, yeah, so, so, so there's a subjective emotional appeal to the, to the item. Okay. To, to the idol, yes. To, to the item. Oh, I to the item, okay. not the idol. Oh, okay. Item. Because uh, he, he didn't just go Baptist on you. Yeah, 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 exactly. He, you know, you, 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 that's that's fine. But you also recognize the truth of what it mm -hmm. is, yeah. right? Christ crucified for Aunt Ma Margaret. Her sin. Margaret, right? Yes. Yes, and your sin. Yes. So that is not subjective. No. But that doesn't mean that, that, that you're not moved pathetically. Right. I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pathetic. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Gavin, I promise I won't keep asking questions. I'm going to let you talk. This is really, this beginning part is really interesting for me to kind of hear. Well, that, that's why I wanted this at the beginning, because if this is at the end, we would never stop. <clears throat> when, you say, when you say the truth, um, can, uh, can the truth be ex? Can the truth be embedded aesthetically rather than logically? Um, so when you, you pointed to that picture and said, you know, we can, this, this is clearly an emotional picture. It's trying to appeal to the emotions. But is there also a truth there? And of course, it sounds like the truth there is a, <clears throat> in spite of the emotion or alongside it. But I'm wondering, the example that keeps popping in my mind is Matthew 1 and the genealogy, in which uh, you, you kind of, you have a uh, way in which narratives can, can uh, and stories, and et cetera, can convey meaning is in a couple of different venues. One is the relationship of history to it, um, but also the, the aesthetic structure. Mm -hmm. and, and Matthew's a good example of this because the, the aesthetic structure of the genealogies actually runs against the history. I mean, we all know from the internal uh, genealogical structures. There aren't actually only 14 generations between Abraham and David and David. And, um, but the meaning of that passage lies in the 14, the aesthetic structures where it lies, not in its correspondence to a perfect genealogy, but precisely in the way in which he arranged it. So that what you have is, you know, no king, king, no king, and then king, and you have David, which is the number 14, all that sort of fitting together. <clears throat> there, the truth of Genesis 1, what Matthew's <clears throat> intending to teach us, is, is conveyed not logically, but aesthetically, you know, through it. And I would say that the, the, it's not that the, the truth is aesthetic, but it's the means by which truth is actually conveyed, rather than kind of alongside it. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, and I wouldn't disagree. I wouldn't disagree. I don't think that... That anything that I'm saying would disagree with that. So you're saying as a, as a passage through which truth can also be conveyed rather than just... The only. Right. Right. Yes. Okay. 
Well, and it seems as though your, to go back to the Aristotle thing, that the, the, the truth, the logos, is actually what informs our pathos and makes us see something as real. Yes. It's that we know it is conveying truth. Right. It is conveying the truth that is above all things. That actually makes it so that we look at it and think that is beautiful. Okay, so when we look at Andy Warhol here, is it, what, is it conveying a truth or is it conveying a pathos? Is it, what, what is this piece of art conveying? Now, this is where the modernists have killed us because this is considered art. But I would not say that it is art that it is, or, or an aesthetic that is rooted in scripture. <clears throat> So you can, you can slap uh, a paintbrush onto a canvas and sell it for a million dollars if you have the right name. That doesn't make it rooted in the truth of Scripture. So what I'm saying is that true beauty, true aesthetics comes from Scripture, and, and it's not necessarily 100% um, objective or 100% subjective. Uh, but that it's like... Um, Oh, what it, what's the what's the phrase? I, I, you know it when you see it. Pornography, the Supreme Court. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they didn't All right. Define it, but basically said, you yeah. know it when you see it. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The story yeah. this slide depends upon which <laughs> Supreme Court. Yeah. So it, it, yeah. Has, yeah. it has it has changed over the years. I just wasn't expecting that. To just sort of jump out there, but all right, here we are at pornography. Um, yeah, no, you know when you see it. You you know when something's perverse, and you know when something is beautiful. I mean, it is it's it's built into us by whom? The Creator that created all things, including that which we see as beautiful. What does the Lord say in Genesis? It's particularly talking about genealogies, and we'll go back to the days. It is good. It is good. It is and good. One time, very good. Yes. Yes, and 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 maybe maybe Satan was up in up in heaven going, Meh. but I doubt it. No, I, I doubt it. Um, and and so in the garden we have uh, the absence of sin, and therefore the perfection and beauty of aesthetics. Let me play devil's advocate because that's what I am. What have you been playing? <laughs> <laughs> it, said, it said good. It didn't say beautiful. Oh. The scripture, scripture in uh, Genesis does not use the term beauty. It says the term good. So how do you bridge the gap there? I believe that beauty is good. Okay. That's, that's a non, that's a non-scriptural uh, conclusion. Yeah, good, good there in, in Hebrew is not just <clears throat> merely ethical good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's I mean when he when he created the world he wasn't it, it, you know he it wasn't in comparative to, to to something bad. It was good. It's not just it's not just ethical. Um, so I don't think I don't think it's a scriptural argument to say that it is an that it is an ethical good. Um, what I, what I see here is is that we are talking past each other because. I, as opposed to yo, I, I don't, I don't subscribe to a um, uh, Socratic, Aristotelian uh, worldview. Uh, I don't, and yeah. I don't, uh, I don't uh, recognize beauty in the same way. And that's partially because I, I was brought up in a diff, in a different culture. I was brought up in the Japanese culture, and my, and you might say, well, what are you talking about, Japanese? Um, <laughs> they they <laughs> recognize <wonderful> beauty, <laughs> beauty, yeah, beauty in art way more arguably than, than a lot of Western cultures. And, and I, I will agree with you. However, the, the treatment of beauty in, within the whole fabric of that, of that uh, philosophical basis is, is quite a bit different. I also note, you also note that I didn't bring up the philosophical, the I did not bring up the philosophical argument. He did, yeah. Right, so, yeah, don't, don't project on me now. <laughs> <laughs> Except that you agree with him, so. You know, what well, no, I, I went along with his example. Um, using the words, using the words yeah, but I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to answer someone using completely different words. Um, 
There he is. Father Hans Jurs von Balthasar. And I want to take a look at this passage in particular. And, and he is uh, bemoaning what he sees, and this is the turn of the century, what he sees as the degradation of beauty or the, the apathy is what we're going to get into later. The apathy of things, all things that are beautiful. We no longer dare to believe in beauty and we make of it a mere appearance in order the more easily to dispose of it. Our situation today shows that beauty demands for itself at least as much courage and decision as do truth and goodness. And she will not allow herself to be banned from her two sisters. Does everybody see where we are there, what, where, where he's going? Because this is pretty, pretty deep passage, and he's sort of, the construct is sort of uh, uh, all, all over the place here. So, and she will not allow herself, who is she? She is beauty. She will not allow herself to be separated and banned from her two sisters without taking along with them herself in an act of mysterious vengeance. Two sisters. What? Truth and goodness. What? The three sisters. Truth and goodness. Oh, 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 okay. Um, we can be sure that whoever sneers at her name, her being beauty, um, as if she were the ornament of a bourgeois past, whether he admits it or not, can no longer pray and soon will no longer be able to love. What do we think? You really want to know? <laughs> sure. I mean, I'm, I agree with this. I'm kidding. I'm abstracted. You know, if, if love is the gravity that, that holds relationship, you know, so that you know, we're created in the image of God to participate in this communion uh, with him, uh, then, then the opposite of that is, is going to be death, loss of So if you're going to just exchange church and say that love or community with God is beauty, then if you reject beauty, if you have turned from that which God has given us by which we participate in what he's created, then we will have nothing. We will not be able to love. We will not have this understanding of beauty and community. Right. I'm, I'm not sure I understand what, what, what you mean by community, but um, you, uh, com you mean... I guess I think of love God in a subjective sense, but in the objective reality of a God who's three persons okay. so perfect. I've got you, I've got you. What is, what is Balthazar's understanding of love? Right. When he well, says you will no longer be able to love, what does he mean by that? Um, what does he mean by love? Yeah. Is, is he taking the scriptural... Yes, uh, yeah, I, I believe if you, if you follow along with this, he's, he's talking about the, the, the divine love of God, and as, as we as Lutherans would understand it, our neighbor as well. If, we, you know, if we're no longer able to pray for our neighbor, we're no longer able to pray uh, to God, soon we will no longer be able to love our neighbor or love God. And this is also how we understand falling from grace. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not a sharp drop off. Um, it's a slow decline. Um, and is he saying that our starting point for that demise is a rejection of what is beautiful? Yes. <clears throat> because it doesn't, it does not, it's not obvious when you talk about ethics that, that beauty is part of that problem. <clears throat> and a good Aristotelian domestic tradition, uh, uh, love is the culmination of uh, truth and goodness. In other words, you, the truth is determined by the intellect, by reason, and, and then goodness is the alignment of the will with those truths of reason, and that can be, an under, that can be understood as the fulfillment of the demands of righteousness of the law. Um, but, yeah, 
particularly Christ law, right? What, what's that? Particularly Christ law. Right, right. But, um, or, or any of the way that the scriptures describe mm-hmm. the righteousness of the Ten Commandments is summed up by love. And the traditional Catholic way of dealing with it is focusing primarily on the relationship of truth and, and goodness. I think he's trying to reinsert the, the third Platonic form as inseparable from that. And, and, and maybe try to argue it, that it actually was originally part of the Catholic tradition to bring these things together. So you can't, you, you can't actually be an ethical creature, even according to scripture, if you only focus on truth and goodness and exclude beauty from the, the tribe. Right, right. And that's why he calls them sisters. Uh, well, hang on, hang on one second. Um, for example, what do you think is the most beautiful thing to you, if we're talking su- su- subjective? Um, and that, and in that sense, yes, it, beauty is subjective. What is the most beautiful thing to you? Um, but we also don't ask that question regarding Jesus. I hope. I hope no one at the end of catechese, at the end of your confirmation classes, say write a paper on what Jesus means to me. Um, I hope not, because it's not it's not subjective. Jesus is not subjective. Um, how we feel, maybe. To me, the most beautiful thing is um, right in the middle of the liturgy, the elevation of the host and the anticipation to come where I receive Christ in both body and blood. To me, that's the most beautiful thing. Not, not, and I've been to the Sistine Chapel. I've been all over Europe and seen beautiful art. Nothing is as beautiful as seeing my Lord held, uh, uh, elevated, uh, per, uh, telling me, um, uh, tell, invi- not telling me, inviting me that here is my body to eat. And drink, and so we're not even. T- I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not even talking about beauty at, at, uh, with eyes necessarily, because we're going to go through that too. I'm talking about taste as well, which is which is why I wanted to start off with objective, subjective, um, and I was not going to necessarily give you an answer because it's not easy to answer. I don't think there is an exact answer because. Um, you can feel a certain way about an object that is objective. But that makes it subjective, so different. <laughs> okay, sensory perception. This is what we're getting, getting into now. Now these are my notes. So we have, we have sort of let, we, we've garnered a, an understanding of beauty using uh, Balthazar, and I'll go ahead and start passing some of these around as, as, as we talk about them. Um, and, and I have almost all of Balthazar's work, but if you've ever seen them, it's like four bookshelves, so I just brought, I just brought that one. Um, sensory perception. In order for aesthetics to catechize, the pastor must put forth the effort to teach what is being perceived. Now, you may agree with this and you may disagree with this. However, um, a font that has eight sides, if the pastor does not put forth the effort to teach what the eight sides mean, they will not, they, they will perceive it visually and not understand it pathetically. Well, they will not even perceive it. Or not even perceive it, right. Um, in fact, uh, I encourage my congregation. I, I don't. The, the the baptismal font is right in front of the chancel, and I I encourage my congregation to touch the font as they come up for communion, um, to acknowledge its presence and that it is there. Um, I don't have the lid off with the water, um, though I I have before. I did, I did during Advent. Um, basically that. Have them actually literally touch the baptismal font as they come up to receive the Lord's Supper. So you have that sensory perception, right? That 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 actual touch of the baptismal font because they know what it means because I've taught them that it's the eschaton. You know, you have the eighth day. That's why you have it in in eight parts. My first parish had three. 
Anyone want to guess what the catechesis is there? Three yeah. strikes you're out. Yeah. <laughs> For the number of times we dunk them, right? And it's kind of funny when we were t when, when uh, 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 yesterday when we were talking about wall, wall theory and polity and uh, uh, and immersion. I thought you know that would be th those those two things would be the worst together if you uh, you know you immerse the, the the baptized and then voted whether or not he's in the congregation and by the time the vote was collected, it's too late. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I, that was a joke, but uh, obviously we understand we, we understand we understand here what the three-sided font means, what the eight-sided font means, but that doesn't mean that the congregation knows what the eight-sided font means or what the three-sided font means. In fact, I'm willing to bet that your congregation does not know 80% of your uh, sanctuary. Now, that's assuming that we worship there and we have not taken the time to teach the sanctuary. And I think that we have to, because it's more than just subjective or objective beauty. It's God's house, and it's where they live, and it's where they receive Christ. And so I would want to know every nook and cranny about that place, what it means, what it doesn't mean. Why do we do what we do? And I believe that that's why we uh, have the worship wars that we do. Uh, I had one pastor tell me that I, I refuse to tell a person how they can, how they will worship God, or how they can worship God. Why? Why what? Why did he tell me that? Why did you ask him why he, he would say such a thing? No, I know. I said, well, God's pretty specific. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, so, so, so you, 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 you can't just say, you, you, you can say that, but really it's just an out to not teach the beauty that has been handed down to us. So, and so, and so my, 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 the entire, my entire work is to teach pastors how to teach their sanctuary. That's where everything started for me. That's where everything started for me. So that so that people would in their house or the God in, in God's house for them, they could see and appreciate so much more the liturgical architecture, the uh, the use of art in pa in painting, um, the crucifix, which we're gonna which we're gonna come to. Why is a why is a corpus better than um, an anti corpus, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, why does it have to be beautiful? Why does it have to be beautiful? Well, what you're describing, for instance, is, uh, is meaning through symbols. Um, but there's nothing in that description. I mean, what's the difference between an, eight, an ugly eight-sided yes. baptismal font and a beautiful one? And why does it matter? What's the difference between uh, a beautiful stole and one that, that, isn't, that, that isn't beautiful? Pornography. What's that? Pornography. Hmm. You know it when That's you see not, it. What? No, no, but <laughs> what's the difference? No, I know. No, I know, I mean, I know. In, in other words, is I mean, are you are you really wanting to talk about uh, at this point? What I see you talking about is I'm sorry, yes, I'm I'm switching, I'm switching it's teaching through symbols. Yes. Um, but the other question is why? Why? How does beauty itself, or the beauty of those symbols, teach, and what does it teach? Because, like you said. The, the beauty of the Eucharist doesn't actually, is actually a theological truth rather right. than a, a, rather than a visual. Yes. Right. Okay. That's what I, that's exactly what I, what I was trying to say from, from the beginning. Now I'm switching gears from our, our understanding of beauty in and of itself to actual aesthetics in and uh, in in the congregation, and eventually we're going to get into the liturgy um, as as an aesthetic, uh, particularly in by through sensory perception. You know, so more than symbol, but the the, the way in which the symbols convey. Yes, yes. Thank you for that. That's exactly. Yeah. Um, 
and I think that's sort of what we, uh, we just, the second point here, we just covered. We just, right. Um, how will they understand what they are perceiving if no one is to teach them? That question has bothered me since before I went to seminary. How will people, because I went to Mequon. Did anybody go to Mequon? I taught at Mequon. Okay. My brother-in-law did, and I went to graduation. Okay, have you, have you ever been to the... Uh, no, the chapel. The chapel. Yes. Okay, you know that when you see it. Okay. Um, and, so, and so I went to Mequon. And so when I would go to, when I would go to chapel, I, and I would see all of these beautiful things, I had no idea what they meant. Now... I was a lowly college student and was just being formed, but I always wanted to know what they meant. And above Christ and the crucifix, there is the uh, a, a, an open light. Does anyone know what's around that open light? It's it's the crown of thorns. And I was never able to put that together. That's why that was there, because the open ceiling is obviously not only to let in natural light, but also to show us the way to Scripture or to, or to heaven. What's that? Um, so that's 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 what began to uh, begin to bother me and constantly bothered me because I didn't I, I could not put the two together um, in my mind and I still don't think that I have it figured out and I think that that's part of being a student of aesthetics and being a student of uh, catechesis because all of this beauty um, uh, the, 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 the liturgy all sensory perception must be used as catechesis because you will perceive you're not going to stop perceiving you know, you're, you, unless you lose your eyes or your nose or your ears or your touch, all of those things, then you're not going to stop perceiving. And therefore, if people are going to perceive, we need to teach. We need to teach what things mean, the symbolism, what they mean, um, and also how to make them beautiful. And of course, we're not talking about taking a vote on it. Pastors, I highly recommend asking the people, your people, <coughs> this question. Do you know what the liturgical appointments are, or do you know, or, or be specific? What, does anyone know why the, the pulpit is where it is? Does everybody know why, where, why the baptismal font is where it is? Do you know why uh, the uh, altar is where it is, and does it matter, and do you care? Now, I recommend rephrasing, <laughs> but, but that's essentially the question, right? Um, at Lenore Ryan, uh, an ELCA college by me in Hickory, they have, they don't have a narthex, they have a baptistry. As soon as you walk in, there's the baptistry. Um, now that teaches, obviously. The floor is different. The statuary is different. Everything is different as you walk into the nave. And then there's a clear separation between the nave and the chancel. And there's a clear separation of the things around the chancel and the altar. Now, what does that say to us? We enter into the church, into the ark, through baptism, 
into the, and then we enter into the ark where we are fed Christ's body and blood as we await and confess his return until he does return. Um, and every, every, I'm not saying that that, that is right and, other, and everything else is wrong, but everything in your sanctuary can be taught. Even if something needs to be moved. We as pastors enter into our congregation assuming that our flock know what is around them and why things are where they are, why the gospel is read from where it is, what the stained glass means, why we use the hymnal that we do, etc., 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 which is why it, I don't find it helpful um, to constantly switch and change things um, in, in, liturgically. I, I, I find that to be distracting, and um, I think it's also a good vote. For, I think it's a good vote for the one-year lectionary, uh, which I am not on, by the way. So I still think it's a good argument for it, even though I'm not on it, um, because when you teach them these things, you can always expound on them homiletically as well. Uh, Wesley, you made the perfect uh, point when you talked about pointing down to, was it down to the crucifix? Or when you were preaching, you're yeah. pointing over to the crucifix. Actually, both, I have two. I have one right below the, the, the pulpit. Okay. And then I had one on the Rereros. Okay, so so either one, either one, either one. Okay, so so you so you're you're using architecture and 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 beauty, which I argue that that there is beauty in the crucifixion, uh, in its ugliness there is beauty. But we'll get there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, <laughs> um, but the the point is, is that you can use these things homiletically to proclaim the truth that is in Scripture. When you enter into the church, and there is the baptismal font. You're, you teach that you enter into the church through baptism. baptism, and you can teach the flood right there. Um, and to get to your point, okay, I want to cut a little bit into your... I was going to say, you're going to get to my point. I don't, I don't I can remember one Lutheran church and one Anglican church that cuts through a lot of what you were saying and addresses it by providing a pamphlet that says, this is a baptismal font, this represents, this means this, this is a symbol of this, this this is this because of that. And uh, this faithful pastor here, Please. yeah, <laughs> um, he, you know, he has something similar uh, in, in his pew. Well, uh, but of, of, the, of the liturgy, you know, of the, yeah, of, the, of the liturgy. But yeah, I see, I see your point. The, the point is that of, of catechesis, of teaching, regardless of the mode, mode the method um, you have to teach. Or the methodology. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, I agree with you totally, but I fail to see the connection to beauty. You leave it for that. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm not sure how I'm not sure how you how you're not seeing the the, the the connection because the beauty is in is in the salvation of baptism. I mean, is that, because I'm not a Westerner. Okay. Well, I mean, I guess that's that's fair. Um, Christians are very uh, are um, Chances are very high that they don't know what those things are, and it brings the it breeds the worst in Christians. What is the worst in Christians? Apathy, apathy. Um, that is the one thing that I think we as pastors need to fear. Don't look, don't care. Yeah, exactly. Um, the mundane, every everyday thing. Where, um, well, well, how how you get creasters, right? The C and E's, um, they just don't bother um, because 
They don't really care. It's not they don't, they don't, they don't come to they don't not come to church because they hate God. They don't come to church because they don't care about God. Or at least not until mom tells them that they have to. Or grandma or whatever on Christmas. Let me allow me to make an observation that those of you who were uh, I'm using the term loosely, born into confessional Lutheranism, uh, were born into the treasure uh, the treasure house, you don't realize the the treasures around uh, that, that surround you in which you you are literally drowning. Somebody like me coming from the outside will look at you and say, you fools, you don't even realize you got all of this beauty, all of this, all of these riches, and you're apathetic about them. Uh, that's why somebody like me uh, who comes and I see these riches, I am excited about it. I am not apathetic about it, and I'm teaching about it because I'm saying, wake up, look around you, see, see what Christ has, has. So we agree. Washed you. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, here, I'm here, I, I, I totally agree with you. Okay, good, good. Yes. Yes. Okay. We got one. <laughs> um. Uh, and so the, the beauty is literally in the salvation. It is literally in the actual, um, not, not only in, in the treasure of uh, the appointments, but also in the uh, remembering of the baptism, the baptism itself, the remembering of the baptism, uh, uh, the reminder of, of the baptism, and the riches in which our doctrine, I don't, I'm sorry, I, I hate that term, in which Christ's doctrine uh, teaches. That, therein lies the beauty. Okay, so you say, I don't, I don't, I don't know whether I agree with you or not. How about, how about that? I'm saying that is irrelevant. That if there is a connection, what is important is the truth of it. Absence of beauty. I, I, I know Balthazar is turning over in his grave. Yes. And, 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 you, and you are turning, and your stomach is turning in in, in, your, in your body. Well, no, I like you. So, so uh, that that's why that's why I've let, uh, you know I've I, I enjoy I, I to be as what, truthful as possible with you. And you're doing a very good job. Uh, what, what, what this is this is a good thing. What we're doing here is is a good thing. I mean that's why this is not easy stuff. This is not easy. Um, uh, no, it isn't. Uh, 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 something to, to, to get our, our minds wrapped around. Now, this is what I have. This is what I have learned. What I have studied. What I have uh, poured my life into. Now, I'm not merely saying that uh, that this is, you know, I don't expect us to have all the right answers right here, right now. Um, however, I you, think you've indicated you don't have all of the answers yet. So, but it, right, exactly. Yeah. Maybe we should. So, on, on this though, are, have we moved right. beyond yeah. Yeah. the relationship of symbol? Because when you say that, like the, the salvation of Christ is beautiful, <clears throat> we're not really talking about the senses in the visual, you know, the, the visual impact of the senses make upon it. We're talking about even in spite of <clears throat> the senses, you're recognizing a an ethical and logical truth out of well, it. Well, no, see, no, I don't. I wouldn't separate them. I wouldn't separate the water that actually. We actually feel on our foreheads. Well, I'm not, I, I don't, I don't I'm not the, the, separating this, but there's no there's no evaluation of the senses in terms of beauty. In other words, uh, I'm still I'm still wondering what the difference is between two in terms of conveying symbolic meaning, uh, two equal things, but one is more beautiful than the other. I mean, can one say, according to your definition, that this eight-sided baptismal font is more beautiful than this one? Right, and that's where subjectivity comes in. So that's irrelevant. So that side of it, in terms of your view, yeah, beauty yeah, and yeah. Okay, for example, what then I think you have a problem with with contemporary music, because you can. I, I, can I do, just, but I, no, no. I think you have. A, I think you have. A, I think you have a problem arguing against it. Okay. Because uh, because I could create a contemporary music service that that follows the ordo, that has the entire text of the liturgy. And the music is to like Bob Dylan, 
I mean, in other words, the, the music. Uh, but you haven't done so. No, you could. No, but no, but I'm saying I've seen people do this. I've seen people say, well, we the, the components of the liturgy are there, but of course the music is quite different. And maybe the music includes electric guitars and and a and a drum kit. Now, uh, then, then, then I would my argument would also include um, what has been handed down. Well, that's good. So, 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 so it would not merely be uh, my, it would not my my argument against it would not merely be one sided. No, 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 I understand, but in terms of this, because you brought this up earlier, aesthetics doesn't seem to be a component in your argument for the for the liturgy or vestments it's its symbolic value and the and the and which the is truth for, which, which is for, in other words which is perceived the though, that's that's the thing that's that's that, that is perceived it's part it's it's, it's perceived uh, sensory yeah but what is what is the, the difference in terms of truth between a gloria in which its melody is is written uh, in the 50s um, or in the 30s um, or today with vastly different instrumentation, but the text is still there. What's the, uh, <clears throat> I'm not arguing for it. I'm not, I, I, I haven't I, seen it done. Well. Wait, wait, well. So we're, I haven't what, seen, I've never seen it done. Oh, this happens all the time. People okay. are writing all sorts of versions of, uh, of, of the text, but they're not doing music you, you like or instruments that you like. So, on what basis, on an aesthetic basis, can you say that this isn't? Yeah. It's conveying the symbol. Right. Okay. It's conveying the truth of the meaning, and yet, my, I suspect you're, you would bristle at it. I bristle at what? Uh, like the guitar version of the Sanctus. Well, yeah, I, I, I would based on taste, yes. And, and, and I understand your point. That's why I said I would not make that argument in one with one direction, one-sided. I would also make that argument from uh, a historical uh, point as well. Uh, that historically we haven't had electric guitars? Mm. No, what has been handed down, well, yeah, well, yes, we could make that argument, but what has been handed down to us? I mean, the majority uh, of the history of the church didn't have organs either. I, 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 I'm, just, I'm, I I'm setting that. you up for a problem here because <clears throat> I think there's, a, there's an important argument to be made for the liturgy on aesthetics, um, but I don't see it as as essential to your argument. Okay, it goes back to. The I mean, that, that, that's fine because that's not that's not the meat of of my uh, presentation either. However, because I mean, you're right. Um, go ahead, please. No, I'm just I'm just just I mean, just kind of thinking out loud, but. But I mean, with sensory perception and sort of interpretation of, of meaning, um, and a lot of that is, I mean, obviously in that sense, very subjective as far as what what people would associate, you know, Bob Dylan esque music with. Yeah, now you got semiotics and associations with. Well, right, right. But, so, but I mean, it's, but isn't that part of the question of, <coughs> of conveying meaning, and also the question of beauty? I mean, I like, I like a particular painting, perhaps in a certain context, or a particular song in a particular context, because it conveys a certain meaning with it. And the truth, uh, I mean, what, what, my, what was it, Kurt Markler made this kind of interesting observation about the, what did he call it, the rock mass or something like that? And, and, that, and that the connotations of, of, of a rock music concert Mm -hmm. convey an idea that it's not, it's not a matter of taste, um, but it conveys an idea that seems to run counter to what we're trying to convey in the divine service, whether it's, whether it's reverence or presence of God uh, kinds of things. Those are also truths. That, yeah, I would also would not separate the, those two, but yeah. Presence of God and reverence, I mean. No, I mean, yeah, right, yeah. Um, so you, you, you basically just answered your your question, right? Well, I have answers no, to do. my question. I'm just wondering. <laughs> <laughs> if your presentation has answers to my question. Well, well, we're on slide number uh, three. 
free. <laughs> um, but yes, and also Dr. Marquardt uh, made made comments regarding um, uh, the, the liturgy and the pastor wearing canary yellow socks as well. Um, wh whether that is uh, appropriate or not. Uh, well, is it distracting from the liturgy and from not a, rivers? Not if it's all this long enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I mean, that, that, that was Dr. Marquardt's point. Well, uh, really quickly, and then we're going to take a, a quick break. So I just got a question. I'm sort of getting lost in the forest for the trees. And I, I'd like a, a little clarification or distinction between symbology, which is beautiful by way of what we teach into it, versus pure aesthetics. Okay, you would like a distinction between the two? Is there a distinction? Yeah. No. I mean, I mean, there there, there can be, uh, but I, I I I don't I don't I don't see how. Uh, uh, well, symbology is so absolutely united with monarchs. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. That, and, and that's that's what I'm trying to get to uh, is <laughs> is, uh, is that, yes, uh, symbology um, is tied to the logos is, is tied to um, because we're going to go are actually going to go into the sanctuary. You know, we're actually going to take a look at what the symbolism teaches um, and that what, what we find in those appointments and in those things, we do find aesthetically pleasing because of the truth that lies within them. Right? The font is a font because we're baptized into it. We're baptized using it. But, but, I, but we also find certain fonts more beautiful than others because of symmetry, because of... I understand that, but that's not, I'm not... I'm not uh, so I'm not so when you say aesthetics, that, yeah, you're true. not actually talking about aesthetics. You're talking about symbology, or you're saying the only aesthetics the church should really be talking about is the symbological ones. Because mm. by, by definition, aesthetics is much broader than symbology. So the way you're using aesthetics is really your... Your it, which is fine, it's just that it's, it's confusing when you're talking about aesthetics and beauty and ask the question of subjective and objectivity. Th those, are br those are bringing a lot more things to play than the meaning of symbols and the function of symbols within, in, in order to teach. Right. Do you know how funnels work? Like funnels. beer bongs? <laughs> like what? <laughs> like beer bongs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, that, that, that's, that, that, that's what that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I'm trying to that's what I'm trying to get accomplished here. Yes, we're we're giving you a hard time at the very beginning of your presentation. We haven't gotten to the place where you're gonna. Yeah. Anyway, those are the questions that are in our heads. Now I'm gonna take a break somewhere. <laughs>